Greetings, River Oaks family. Zach here for our eighth and final lesson on the Ordo Salutis, From Here to Eternity. Last time we looked at sanctification and how that is to be the lifelong pursuit of a Christian by the power of the Holy Spirit to grow in Christ's likeness. Ultimately, that process will not be completed this side of heaven. And so we look forward to the day of our Lord's return, and if he should tarry, the day he calls us home to be with him in heaven. And this brings us to what we will examine together today, glorification, glorification. So grab your Bibles and let's jump in. Grudem helpfully defines glorification as, quote, the final step in the application of redemption. It will happen when Christ returns and raises from the dead the bodies of all believers for all time who have died and reunites them with their souls and changes the bodies of believers who remain alive, thereby giving all believers at the same time perfect resurrection bodies like his own. The key here is that all believers will be given perfect resurrection bodies when Christ returns. Glorification is the consummation of our salvation. If you recall, Paul writing to the church in Rome, in Romans chapter 8, verses 29 through 30, kind of our proof text for our journey through the Ordo Salutis, says this, for those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. Glorification is the consummation of our salvation. In justification, believers are freed from the penalty of sin, as we looked at. In sanctification, they are freed from the power of sin. In glorification, they are finally freed from the very presence of sin in both body and soul. Glorification is also the fulfillment of Jesus' desire to see his church purified from all spot, wrinkle, or any such thing. Look at Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5, verses 25 through 27. Paul writes this, Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. Without blemish means both physically and morally perfect. Glorification. Paul here, uh, or excuse me, Paul also alludes to glorification when he writes to the Philippians. In Philippians chapter 1, verse 6, he says this, And I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. The good work of sanctification will be completed. Believers will experience glorification at the day of Jesus Christ. That is his coronation as King of Kings, and the inauguration of his kingdom. Paul explains further the events of the day of Jesus Christ when he writes to the Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 51 through 52. Paul says, Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment. In the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised imperishable, and we shall be 
changed. We shall all, that is, believers, be changed. The dead will be raised imperishable. Believers who are alive at the return of Christ will be given resurrected, glorified bodies. Paul also addresses the resurrection glorified bodies in his letter to the Thessalonians. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 16, Paul writes this, For the Lord himself, Jesus, will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with the voice of an archangel, and with the sound of the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we, who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we will always be with the Lord. The dead in Christ, those believers who have died prior to the return of Christ, will rise first. Then believers who are alive will be caught up with those who have been raised first to meet the Lord in the air. This is what is known as the rapture. But look at what happens at the rapture. All believers, those who have been dead and those who are alive, will be with the Lord always in a resurrected and glorified body. Paul goes on to write that these words should be used for encouragement for one another. Often we find them used as divisive and words of frustration between different groups of people. But Paul says that these words should be used for encouragement. Believers should find encouragement in the truth of the glorification, the resurrected body, and being with the Lord always. But Paul's not the only one who speaks of resurrection bodies. I want to I want to turn our attention to the Old Testament because Job alludes to a resurrected body. Job chapter 19, verses 25 through 27, Job says this, For I know that my Redeemer lives, and at the last he will stand upon the earth, and after my skin has been thus destroyed, yet in my flesh I shall see God whom I shall see for myself, and my eyes shall behold, and not another. My heart faints within me. You see, Job, even after his skin has been destroyed, which is a poetically, it's it's him poetically alluding to the idea of decomposition after death. But in his flesh, that is, in his body, his resurrected body, he would see God with his own eyes. Also, if you remember the vision of Ezekiel in the Valley of Dry Bones, Ezekiel chapter 37, verses 7, So I prophesied as I was commanded, this is Ezekiel speaking, and as I prophesied, there was a noise, and behold, a rattling. And the bones came together, bone to its bone, and I looked, and behold, sinews were on them, and flesh grew, and skin covered them, but there was no breath in them. Notice, Ezekiel saw a vision of how bones can be fastened back together. Sinews, that is, muscle and tendon structures, can be put back together. Flesh grows on these bones, on these tendons, on these muscles, and ultimately skin covered them. If you read on within Ezekiel 37, they arose and were a great army. And although this is a spiritual reality within his vision, recognize resurrection, even from decomposed bodies, is possible with God. He alone created the human body, and he alone can bring even bodies long gone back to life. So as we've looked, both the Old Testament and New Testament speak of bodily resurrection. Although the fulfillment of the Old Testament resurrection is ultimately seen in and through Christ's resurrection, and so we learn a bit about the resurrected body from Christ's resurrected body. This always fascinates me. You see, remember, Christ was resurrected in the very body he died and was buried in. In John chapter 20, verse 16, 
Jesus says to Mary after she thinks he's the gardener, she turned and said to him in Aramaic, Rabboni, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, Mary, she turns and recognizes, it's Jesus, it's my teacher. He was physically recognizable. And this attests to the fact that his resurrected body is his same body. Fascinatingly enough, Christ's resurrected body can go through locked doors. John chapter 20, still verse 19. On the evening of that day, that is the first day of the week, the doors were locked where the disciples were for fear of the Jews. Jesus came and stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. This is by far uh, one of the better passages in Scripture of Christ's resurrected body. He appears through a locked door and surprises the disciples, and he says, Peace be with you. Fascinatingly enough, it continues. Christ's resurrected body bears the scars of his crucifixion. John 20, 20. When he said this, that is, peace be with you, he then showed them his hands and his side. Why would he do that? His hands were the nails pierced through, and the spear pierced through his side. We learn later on that Thomas was not there when Jesus appeared to the disciples, and so he appears again while Thomas is with them. This is later on in John chapter 20, verse 27. Then Jesus said to Thomas, Put your finger here, and see my hands, and put out your hand, and place it in my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. Not only does Christ's resurrected body, excuse me, bear the scars You can see them, but you can feel them and touch them and place your hand in them. And Christ's resurrected body may bear scars, but it is imperishable. And so shall the believer's resurrected body be imperishable. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 42, So it is with the resurrection of the dead. What is sown is perishable, and what is raised is imperishable. Paul goes on to explain that this resurrected body, though marred by scars, is marked by glory. Verse 43, if, that is, the body is sown in dishonor, it is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness, it is raised in power. Paul says, sown in dishonor because sin, and as the instrument of man's sinful acts, the body is dishonored and weak because the body is weak. It faces sickness. It faces things like COVID-19 and myriad other viruses and diseases, but the resurrected body will be powerful. It will have perfect strength as intended before the fall and and death, which wreaks havoc on physical bodies. And finally, in the same chapter of 1 Corinthians, verse 44 of chapter 15, Paul writes, It is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. If there is a natural body, there is also a spiritual body. Paul does not intend to say that this resurrected body will be immaterial. Jesus himself, in his resurrected body, acknowledged his own flesh and bone and ate broiled fish. That's recorded in Luke chapter 24. Paul, rather, is teaching here that the resurrected body will be in perfect harmony with the Spirit of God. In perfect sanctification, and glorification. Believers will now have a heart, a spirit undisturbed by sin, and godly ambitions and aspirations which they were unable to carry out perfectly will thusly be 
carried out in a physical body without distraction, weakness, or any other problematic function, it will be perfection, glorification. And they will ultimately, in this resurrected body, be able to fully enjoy the new heavens and new earth God has prepared for his people. That is glorification. The consummation of so great a salvation. And so we join together with the chorus of those who sing the praises of our great God. Peter says, Blessed be the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you who by God's power are being guarded through faith for salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. Paul ultimately recognizes, excuse me, Peter ultimately recognizes that he needs to point his readers to the fact that glorification is the consummation of salvation. That we await an inheritance that is imperishable, that is un defiled. It is not touched. It doesn't fade. It doesn't change. And it's reserved. It's kept in heaven for you individually if you're numbered among God's elect. And then he goes on to challenge the readers and encourage them that though they may be tested by various fiery trials, that they should look to their Savior. And remember that glorification is coming. But much like Christ, who found himself glorified, it wasn't until after he suffered and died. And so suffering, persecution, comes before glorification. And so we await. We await the coming of our Lord. If he should tarry, we await our death and the joining together with him and ultimately look forward to his inauguration of his kingdom and his coronation as king as we become his co-heirs and gain our inheritance that was purchased by his blood on the cross and that is a great salvation. That is why we seek to understand all these doctrinal truths. Because ultimately, what it boils down to is worshiping and praising God for the truth that is found within his glorious, inerrant, infallible, an authoritative word. Let's pray. Father God, how great a salvation. What an honor and a privilege to be called, to be brought in through justification and adoption and called to sanctification and ultimately to glorification in Christ Jesus. We pray that by the indwelling power of the Holy Spirit that the truths that we've examined together over these last few weeks together would be pushed down deep into our hearts, that they would grow and that they would bear much fruit for our good and your ultimate glory. We thank you for
the process of salvation as you've outlined it in scripture. We thank you for the truth that exists within your word that shows us how salvation plays out. And we pray that you would encourage our hearts as we face difficult days to look to you and to long to eagerly await, as the scripture says, and to hasten even your coming so that we may indeed share in your glorification and be with you always. It is in this hope and expectation that we pray these things in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. I want to thank you once again for joining me as we've sought to explore the Ordo Salutis. I hope that you've learned much as I have, even studying this, preparing for these lessons, and that you have been encouraged and challenged for the sake of the gospel and the glory of our great God. Until next time, blessings.